affirmative action as an issue in itself. I read up a little bit on the history of this. The first use of the term affirmative action takes place in an executive order, John Kennedy, 1961. He's telling government contractors to take affirmative action to make sure that none of their employees is discriminated against yes. on the basis of race. Johnson, President Johnson issues a, an executive order in 65 with almost the same wording. And in between these two, this executive order in 61 and the executive order in 65, we get the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race. And Senator Hubert Humphrey was the floor manager of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and he said the act, quote, would prohibit, prohibit preferential treatment for any group. Humphrey added, quote, I will eat my hat if this leads to racial quotas, close quote. Yes. And so this is the mid-60s. By the mid-70s, racial quotas are the stuff and substance of affirmative action. Bakke comes along and says, you're not allowed to have quotas, but you're allowed to take race into effect into account in admissions decisions. So quotas get drop out of the picture, but still it's preferential treatment. It begins with a notion of neutral treatment, mm -hmm. just enforcing equality before the law, but quickly becomes preferential. Why is there, how did that happen? Well, I, I, guess, I guess there are people who wanted to push this as far, as far as they could, but it's also true that uh, in other countries, where they've had the similar things, because these programs are not unique to the United States. Uh, in India, for example, uh, the, the courts said, you know, you can't have these kinds of preferences. Uh, you, you have to, you know, give everybody an equal chance individually. Uh, but they allowed them to take into account various, th various subjective things. And of course, in India, what they would do, they would have a five minute interview with each uh, student and the students whose who scores were, were not high enough, they gave them high marks on, on the interview. And the others who were up at the top, they gave them low marks on the interview. And apparently, I gather from some things that I've heard, that, the, that Harvard, uh, that the, the, the Asian students always get a lo low ra ratings on these subjective things, which at can't Harvard. be checked, yes. And others get high, get high ratings. So you, you, you can play these word games, uh, and I just fear uh, that uh, this decision, which seems good and certainly overdue, uh, will not lead to that kind of thing. When people back in the 50s in the northern states were, were trying to get rid of uh, racial discrimination, one of the things they did was say, you cannot uh, submit a, a photo, require applicants to submit photographs. When Woodrow Wilson first in, in introduced uh, uh, this th kind of thing into the federal system, he wanted photographs. So, so if what you're saying is you can't explicitly give preferences, but if you can find out the race of the people, then you can subjectively take that into account and the whole thing will be a farce. We'll find out whether they were serious or not. I, I, I've, there's a wonderful book called Mismatch about the, the bad effects of, of affirmative action on college students. Uh, and in it, the, the, the authors, I agree with them with everything to, until they say that, you know, the Supreme Court should take into account this and that and the other things. And my response is, the last thing we need is nine more politicians in Washington. Justice O'Connor writes, race-conscious admissions policies must be limited in time. The court expects that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. Okay, so the court doesn't like racial preferences. And you could even say, wait a minute, why is it that something that would be unconstitutional 25 years from now isn't unconstitutional today? But Sandra Day, these, these are decent, well-meaning people. Weren't they on to something? Didn't it do some good, even if it was in tension with the Constitution? Yes, and it did a, a whole lot of bad. And what was the bad that it did, Tom? Oh my, it, 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 well, it put many black students with all the prerequisites for success into places where they were almost guaranteed to fail. Let me, uh, I'll go all the way back to 1965 when I was teaching at Cornell. Uh, they, they suddenly brought in uh, large numbers of black students under special programs. And in 
relatively short times, half of them are on, on academic uh, probation because for ac academic deficiencies. And so I went over to the uh, uh, administration building and looked, looked up their SAT scores. The average black student at Cornell at that time was at the 75th percentile. Which is good. Yes. The better, better than three quarters of the of other American students who took the, took the SAT. The average uh, student in the Cornell Liberal Arts College was at the 99th percentile. And so, so one, you have the students who simply do not graduate. And so there's no, there's no great gain from flunking out of an elite institution. Uh, so we, would you, Cornell University took really gifted black kids mm. and spent four years Making failures out of them. Making failures out of them. This is not unique to Cornell. Um, back when we had, uh, in the, in the, later on in the 20th century at Berkeley, uh, they had uh, black and Hispanic kids who, got, who were admitted there. They, were, they had test scores just slightly above the national average. Uh, the, the white students had uh, uh, test scores far above that. And the Asian students had it above the white students. And the great bulk of those black students, an absolute majority, failed to graduate. So they came on campus, wasted some years of their lives, some opportunities they may have had somewhere else. And they were talented people. Yeah, and, and, they, and they, they were people who could have, in any place else, the other, the other, other fallacy is the notion you're getting a better education at a higher rated institution. You, universities... Uh, are rated according to the research output of their faculties. They are not rated according to the teaching quality. No one in his right, Berkeley is one of the great universities of the world in research. No one in his right mind thinks that the education offered to undergraduates at Berkeley is anything, that, any, any, anything to, uh, to look up to. And so you send them not only to places where, where, they, where they, they cannot compete with the other students, but where the faculty really don't give much attention to that. The, 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 the California uh, voters voted to end pre preferential admission to, to the university system. There were dire con uh, com complaints that this would mean no black students would be able to get this and that and so forth. The actual data show that the number of black students in the UC system barely changed at all. Uh, what happened was that they stopped going to Berkeley and UCLA. They went to the other campuses where their uh, proficiency was like that of the other students. In the wake of that, uh, over a four-year period, there were a thousand more minority students graduating from the system than there were under affirmative action. Moreover, that's well, the other thing that happened. So even the ones who uh, stay there and graduate they, they, they may come in wanting to become uh, engineers, uh, mathematicians, scientists. They find they cannot possibly make it in that institution. And so they come out taking sociology, ethnic studies. They go from the hard material to the soft stuff. Yeah, and from material that will provide you with a, with a well-paying career to an uh, 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 outcome that will provide you for, with nothing. All right. By the way, this brings us to the concurring uh, opinion Justice Clarence Thomas mm -hmm. writes in St Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard. Affirmative action, he writes, fails to increase the overall number of blacks and Hispanics in universities. Quote, rather, those racial policies simply redistribute individuals, placing some into more competitive institutions than they would otherwise have attended. Studies suggest that large racial preferences for black and Hispanic applicants have led to a disproportionately large share of those students receiving mediocre or poor grades. C. T. Soul, affirmative action around the world. Um, I couldn't help thinking, you told me at one point, I think your first paying job was as a Western Union telegram yes, delivery boy. Yes. Tom, you're now being quoted in Supreme Court decisions. Well, I'm not sure. The, uh, I'm not. That's uh, not a promotion. Would, <laughs> <laughs> there was. In these decisions, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the majority decision. Justice Thomas wrote a concurring decision. Justice Jackson uh, wrote a, a dissent. Mm. And Justice Jackson and Justice Thomas had at each other mm. in their decisions. I thought it was a fascinating exchange. 
The, these are the two African He went to Yale Law School. She went to Harvard Law School. These are both very bright people. Let me read a few quotations okay. from Justice Jackson, and then we'll go to Justice Thomas. Mm -hmm. This is Justice Jackson. Gulf-sized race-based gaps exist with respect to health, wealth, and the well-being of American citizens. They were created in the distant past, but have indisputably been passed down to the present day. Yet today, this court determines that holistic admissions programs, by which she means programs that take race into account, are a problem rather than a viable solution as has long been evident to historians, sociologists, and policymakers alike. Close quote. What do you make of that? Well, it's, it's, if, if, if what she said was true, it would, it would have implications. None of it's true. None of it's true. None of it's true. Or the, or it does have the support of the academic elite. I, 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 it does have that. And some people regard that as the same as a documented fact. I'm not one of those people. All right. Justice Jackson continues, to be sure, black people, incidentally, she capitalizes black. Oh, good, which good. You, which you don't do. Yes, yeah. All right. Black people and other minorities have generally been doing better in recent years. But those improvements have only been made possible, not helped, not enhanced, but only been made possible because institutions like the University of North Carolina have been willing to grapple forthrightly with the burdens of history, close quote. Dr. Sowell? Well, they're, they're, I wasn't aware that the University of North Carolina is, uh, is qualified to gra gra grasp the, uh, the, the forces burdens of history. Of history. Right. Yes, I would like to see some facts about that, this. So, the same thing, similar pattern of uh, the UC system you see in a place like uh, MIT. One study showed that the average black student at MIT uh, scored in the top 10% on the math portion of the SAT, and in the bottom 10% at MIT. Oh. I mean, in, in, in MIT, it's only a question of which part of the, of the 99th percentile you're in. Right. right. And so, and, and <laughs> again, there have been, been actually empirical studies done with medical schools, law schools, and in every single case, where the black students are put in where, 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 where places where the other students have similar SAT scores of their own. They learn more. And in, in, in professions like law and medicine, there is an independent test, independently of the institution that you were tested in, to see whether you can pass the, the, the outside test to get, get license. Our exam and so that, That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, the, 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 one, one, in one case in uh, back east, uh, there was there was a high test, high high uh, high ranked law school and a lower ranked law school. The black students in both places had very similar SAT scores. When when they came to the bar exam, the black students in the lower ranked institution passed the uh, bar exam on the on the first try, fifty seven percent of the time. The, and the ones in the high ranked one passed it thirty percent of the time. You learn more in a place where, where, where they're teaching. The professors teach to the level of the students that they have. and when, That's their job, after all. Yeah, yeah. And, and when, when I was teaching, uh, you know, when I, when I taught at Howard University, which, which is a black institution, most of the kids have not had the top education up to that point. And I'd come to, to, to the concept of marginal cost and economics. I'd have some arithmetic examples to explain what marginal cost meant. When I taught at Cornell, I taught a class to engineers, all of whom had calculus, and I would say, well, marginal cost is the first derivative of total cost, and go on. Now, you know, there's no point in my, you know, but so the guy who's, who's, who's not had that, these guys at Cornell had probably had calculus in high school. Right. And, and, and the kid who's come out, out of the ghetto school doesn't have that. He doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. 